Now we are moving on the electrocardiogram, which is the key point of the screening, which, uh, as you know, raises some uh, questions, doubts. And uh, I ask to Gerardo to make an introductory lecture on the electrocardiogram. The, he mentioned, already mentioned the revised criteria. He mentioned the increased sensitivity and specificity of the revised criteria. What are these revised criteria? The revised criteria, as he will teach us, uh, are the criteria to read the electrocardiogram in Atlas. So, Gerardo. All right, thank you. So, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I will um, discuss uh, uh, the ECG, the normal ECG finding in athletes, and I will follow mainly this, uh, um, these slides, uh, which is from the international um, recommendation for the ECG in athletes. And uh, we see that uh, this is a um, publication of this year in uh, JAK, European Heart Journal, and BGSM, and uh, we see that there are three boxes here. So on the left we have the green box, so we have the normal ECG findings. Then uh, in the middle we have uh, the orange box, so we have borderline ECG findings, and on the right we have the red box, which is the abnormal ECG finding. So I think, uh, first of all, we have to remember something that I think is very important when we read an ECG. Uh, that the ECG is a diagnostic tool that requires a systematic approach, so we have to go through each bit of the ECG, and we have to try not to forget anything. And then the second thing is that a good ECG interpretation requires knowledge of the demographic and clinical context of the patient. So, of course, the ECG of an athlete is not as the same as an ECG of a non-athlete. The ECG of an 80 years old is not the same as an ECG of a 20 years old. So we have to, we have to remember that. And of course, uh, the, the presence of symptoms or presence of a significant family history are things that we have to consider. And probably the international recommendations uh, go out of the window if there are significant symptoms or um, uh, significant family history. So, uh, as we have said before, um, there has been a development in the, um, in the uh, criteria for the interpretation of athletes uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, with a reduction, a significant reduction of false positive. So, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I will focus on uh, the normal ECG finding and the borderline ECG findings. So, first of all, uh, we have seen this before, um, ECG, the ECG in athletes may be very different from the ECG in non-athletes, and we have to be very thorough in uh, uh, analyzing the ECG of, uh, of athletes because uh, there may be some changes that may be suggestive of deadly condition like Brugada syndrome or long QT or cardiomyopathies, and we have really to recognize these patterns from patterns that are really uh, instead uh, just uh, um, um, just, just uh, related to uh, cardiac adaptation to exercise. So, for example, in this case, uh, we see different, uh, different changes. Uh, um, so, we see, first of all, that uh, there is bradycardia. So, the heart rate is uh, less than 50 beats per minute. Uh, then we have right axis deviation. Okay? Then we have also uh, sokolov lyon criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy. Then we have incomplete right bundle branch block. And then finally we have early repolarization. All these changes are normal, so are considered to be normal in athletes. So even if at the first look we see this ECG and we may think that, oh, maybe there is something abnormal with this athlete in reality, uh, all these changes are considered to be absolutely normal. As we see here, um, it is, uh, um, the, all these changes are in the green box, so considered to be normal ECG findings in athlete. And I repeat, uh, sinus radicardia, right band, incomplete right bandage branch block, early repolarization criteria, circle of lion criteria, voltage criteria for LVH. So sinus bradycardia, of course, uh, it is defined by heart rate less than 60 beats per minute. Uh, um, we can have a very profound bradycardia in athletes. So um, 
Really, I would say that uh, bradycardia is uh, a completely normal finding in athletes, and if there is not bradycardia, we should think that there is something abnormal. Maybe the individual that we have in front of us is not an athlete. So bradycardia is absolutely found in, in every athlete. However, sometimes we have a very profound bradycardia with less than 30 beats per minute. Um, and in this case, we further investigate. Then sinus arrhythmia. Uh, so we have a PP interval that gradually lengthens and shortens in a, clinical, in a cyclical fashion. Uh, and it corresponds usually to the phases of the respiratory cycle. Again, this is an absolutely normal finding, so uh, nothing to be worried about. What about the voltage criteria? Uh, so there are various voltage criteria. Probably the most used is the Sokolov Lyot criteria. So we have R wave in V5, V6, plus S wave in V1, more than 35 millimeters. And we have to remember that voltage criteria are not accurate to identify left ventricular hypertrophy in young individuals and in athletes. And uh, in our experience, uh, we found that in elite athletes, males, roughly 40-50% have Sokolov-Lyon criteria for LVH. In females, roughly 10-15%. So it's more common in males. Uh, there are other criteria to identify LVH, uh, and uh, there are more accurate uh, in identifying uh, real left ventricular hypertrophy at the echocardiogram or MRI. For example, the Romilt Estes criteria, which put together um, 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 uh, a point methods that include uh, left, uh, left arterial enlargement, LV strain, uh, voltage criteria, QRS duration. So there are several points. Uh, that uh, um, make uh, the Romil testes criteria. And here we have an example. So we have uh, left atrial enlargement, we have voltage criteria, we have LV strain that is, uh, that is visualized especially in the uh, lateral leads. What about the voltage criteria for RVH? Uh, so um, the Sokolov Lyon criteria says that uh, predominant R wave in V1 plus uh, a profound S um, wave in V5, V6, uh, and the sum more than uh, 10 millimeters uh, uh, are the voltage criteria for RVH. This is a completely normal finding in athletes, so we don't have to be worried if we find this. Um, this is a recent study from, from our group, from uh, uh, Abbas Zaidi, and uh, what he found is that basically there was no correlation with echocardiogram in terms of RV dimension or RVH. There was no correlation with pathology, and uh, these criteria was, were never in isolation in patients with ARVC or pulmonary hypertension. Of course, this is a very different ECG. So also here we have... Uh, um, we have voltage criteria for RVH. We see we have a predominant R wave uh, in V1. We have a, a deep S wave in uh, um, V5, V6. But this is a completely different ECG, however. This is a pathological ECG because there are other changes. Uh, there are T wave inversion in the precordial leads, T wave inversion in the inferior leads. So this is not a normal ECG. So this is a normal ECG, okay, in isolation. V1 uh, wave, uh, uh, S wave in V5, V6. This is an abnormal ECG because there are other changes. Okay, this is an ECG of a patient with pulmonary hypertension. Then we have uh, early repolarization, uh, which is a very common finding, especially in male athletes. More than 50% of um, our elite athletes show this pattern, so which is a, basically a J-point elevation more than one millimeter that is um, visualized especially in the lateral leads. Absolutely normal finding. And it's very important to uh, differentiate this finding from other ST changes, other ST elevation, for example, in, um, in, in STEMI, in um, ST uh, elevation um, infarction, or in other condition as uh, pericarditis. So we have significant differences there, even if the 
uh, pericarditis uh, um, pattern may be similar to the early repolarization in pericarditis, of course, we have to have symptoms and the uh, ST elevation is diffused in all the, um, in all the leads. Then incomplete right management block, which is defined by the presence of uh, RSR prime pattern in the uh, lead V1 with a, a QRS duration of less than 120 milliseconds. Again, this is a very common pattern in athletes. It's absolutely normal, so we don't have to do anything about it. So the message one is that uh, type 1 training-related ECG phenotypes are common in athletes and do not warrant further investigations. Then we have borderline ECG findings. So this is the uh, orange box. So in, this, in those cases, if we have uh, these changes in isolation, we don't have to do anything else. But if we have uh, uh, more than one of these changes, so if they are combined, then we have to do some further investigations, usually an echocardiogram as a first line. So, uh, complete right bandage brand flock is defined by an RSR prime pattern in V1 with a duration of more than, a QRS duration of more than 120 milliseconds. So, complete right bandage branch block, if it is in isolation, is considered to be normal in athletes. Uh, and the reason why, there are some studies that show that uh, uh, right bandage branch block, uh, development of right bandage branch block, uh, um, could be simply related to cardiac adaptation. We know that uh, athletes have a dilatation of all four chambers, including the right ventricle, and so uh, in some way the right bundle branch block is, uh, is related to that. Uh, however, if we look at the ECG of uh, a non-athlete, so for example a sedentary individual, uh, that is young, and we see a right bandage branch block, which is complete. Uh, in our experience, uh, we usually tend to do an echocardiogram. So this is in some way a difference between um, the interpretation in athletes and non-athletes. So if we have an, an athlete, an elite athlete, yes, right bandage branch block, uh, okay, we consider it as cardiac adaptation, but if it is not an athlete, we tend to do an echocardiogram. Um, what about left axis deviation and right axis deviation? Again, this is, these are changes that if they are in isolation, they are considered to be normal. So we don't do anything about it. What about uh, left atrial enlargement? Again, so if we have, uh, pr um, in the case of left atrial enlargement, prolonged P wave duration, more than 120 milliseconds, so more than three little squares on the ECG on the, the lead one uh, or two, or uh, the plus minus minus, so a um, predominant negative portion of the P wave in V1, then we have left um, atrial enlargement. It's normal if it is in isolation because we know that athletes may have left atrial enlargement and it's, it's very common uh, in athletes to, to show these kind of changes. So if it is in isolation, it's normal. And uh, again, we see normal on the right uh, and left atrial enlargement with plus, minus, minus on the left. Right atrial enlargement, a P wave uh, of uh, voltage of more than 2.5 millimeters in the inferior leads. Uh, again, in isolation, is considered to be normal. Um, this, uh, uh, this borderline changes and uh, the fact that these borderline uh, changes are considered to be normal if in isolation, um, the evidence for that arises mainly from uh, uh, a study from our group um, uh, which showed that uh, these changes in isolation are extremely rare in cardiomyopathies, while are quite common in athletes. Forty-two percent of the changes were um, type 2 changes, so borderline changes, orange box um, on the international recommendation. So uh, again, uh, the second message is that if we have a borderline ECG criteria, and I repeat, left axis deviation, left atrial enlargement, right axis deviation, right atrial enlargement, or complete right bandage branch block in an elite athlete, these changes in isolation don't require any further evaluation, but if they are combined, uh, further evaluation uh, is required. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.